Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, Charles W. Chuck Bryant. Howdy. His middle name's Wayne. My yeah. middle name's Malcolm. There we have it. I always forget about that, Malcolm. Yeah, Wayne. <laughs> Named after Wayne Coyne, right? Uh, no, John Wayne. And you were named after Malcolm in the Middle. <laughs> That's right. Right? Frankie Muniz is my namesake. <laughs> I hope he's okay. Early Brian Cranston, too. I used to love that show. Oh, it's a great show. I watched it, um, like, within the last couple months. I was cleaning the house and put <laughs> yeah. it on Netflix. And still great. Yeah? Yeah, it really it is a good show. So you clean your house, you put on your VR goggles and just queue up Malcolm in the middle? Yeah. No, I just... You walk around and bump into things and... <laughs> right, exactly. But I I put on like a huge feather duster suit. Yeah, so you're just <laughs> cleaning and bumping into things. That's right. That's how I do it. Wow. Yeah. It works kind of well. Someone's going to take that idea. Yeah, they, they like the Sharknado? Yeah, but they should just, they should sell that suit with a uh, purple drink. <laughs> I think you'd just get one spot on the floor really, really clean. <laughs> uh, what are you going to title this one, by the way? Because this was your pick and we title our own shows, episodes. Oh, uh, some horror films that change the genre. All right. And you should add this, a.k.a. How could you guys forget blank? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We should say like this. First of all, this is a Grabster article. So it's Grabster's list. Sure. And he knows what he's talking about. If you look at some of the entries, some don't even have source tags. Whoa. He's just like, I just know. I he should just, just, know. just source trust tag me. it, Grabster. But we even took his list and carved some out and put some in. Sure. So this is, how about this? This is Josh and Chuck's idea of some horror films that change the genre featuring the mind of the grabster yes in other words it is not a complete list of every horror film that changed the genre yes because i would argue that well and actually i see grabster put texas chainsaw massacre in there he said that if this were a top 15 list <clears throat> that would be in there so would alien yeah he has that alien uh ringu and the u.s remake ring and uh, i would lobby for uh well, Psycho didn't make it onto his list, which but we're going to put that in. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was one more. Oh, even though I didn't really think it was that great, uh, the movie Saw, I think, kind of changed horror films. And that's was what that, this list is. Not best horror films, but things that kind of changed the game. Yeah. It seems like Saw kind of kicked off that... that uh, Torture porn? Yeah, didn't it? I can't or remember if it was that or hostile. One of the two. What a it was definitely one of the two for a subgenre. Well, it's pretty accurate, actually. It is, but most of these are, are movies that either uh, were the first of its kind and maybe did start a subgenre, or movies that were so popular that they just you know kind of rewrote how people view horror movies. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of them because of marketing, some because they were really good movies, some because of box office. But all of these, I don't think anyone could argue, did not change the genre. How about that? Sure. Yeah, I think that's well put, dude. Uh, and before we get started, speaking of horror, I want to give a plug to Whoa. my friend Toby's movie that's coming out. He's a producer yeah. on a movie coming out called The Ghost Story. Yeah, Toby... Uh, when we met Toby, well, you knew Toby before me, of course, because he's your friend. But and he, I know him through Yumi, so really, yeah. He's Yumi's friend. But he was he was small time doing short films and stuff. Mm -hmm. And since that time, and this has been within the last like since we've been doing this podcast, yeah, he's now big time. Yeah, they did Pete's Dragon. Yeah, um, and then yeah, they have this this they did Ain't Them Body Saints was I think the one that they kind of broke out with, which I love that movie. And then this one. Um, it definitely kind of falls into that same look and mood and feel. Which, uh, it's called A Ghost Story, and I think it comes out in July. And uh, I think it's labeled a drama rather than horror or even supernatural or thriller. Um, 
But the reason I tie it into horror is because A24 <laughs> is releasing it. And A24 is killing it oh, yeah. with horror movies lately. Yeah, that's a good uh, that's a good outfit. They did The Witch. Great they did movie. The Black Coat's Daughter. Have you seen that? Uh, no. It's on Amazon Noel's Prime. Nodding. They, it's on Amazon Prime right now. No, it's nodded one, and gave a thumbs up. <laughs> dude, it's one of the best horror movies I've seen in a while. I think The Witch is probably my favorite right now. Yeah. Black Coat's Daughter is a close second. And then last night, I saw It Comes at Night in the theater. Uh-huh. And It Comes at Night actually upset my stomach. Ooh. The ending did. It was it was that rough. Yeah, I think we're we've we're at a place with horror movies that we haven't been in a long time. Like a really genuine... Good spot. Yeah, like the whole torture porn sort of era is over, and the found footage thing is so played. Oh, man. But I think we, like with movies like The Witch, I think we've really, like there are some really creative... Uh, uh, it Follows, did you see that one? Yeah. Like some just really creative ways of bringing scares that I haven't or, seen before. Get Out? That was amazing. Did you I, see Get no, Out? man, I still haven't seen it. You're gonna love it. I, know. I, I I'm I'm envious of you. It's really it's great movie, Chuck. You're gonna love it. Well, I don't get to the movies much anymore, and the only time I could was a couple of weeks ago, and I elected to see Wonder Woman. Yeah, not Just a bad kidding. choice. So, a long way of saying congratulations to Toby and his new film. <laughs> well, that's funny. We also need to congratulate Toby too because Toby just got married. Toby yeah. and Annell are now married. So congratulations the to them as well. So for is this that. is this new movie with uh, his. Uh, directing partner david lowry mm-hmm. yeah yeah and rooney mara man they got a good thing it. going yeah they they definitely do so it's gonna be good i'm looking forward to it awesome okay so let's get started thanks for for <laughs> indulging that thank you everybody so the first the first movie on our list is what's widely considered the first horror movie and it's a 1920 movie out of germany that um, basically was the first film that undertook what's the artistic movement known as German Expressionism. Yeah. It's called The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Yeah. I mean, some say, like you said, it was the first horror movie. Some say it was the first cult film. Um, It, uh, well, just, you may not be able to get through the whole thing if you're not into silent movies, but you should cue up a little bit of it and watch a little bit of it. Um, because it's hugely impactful um, and still to this day, like very disconcerting to look at because of it, how um, ominous and weird it looked. Yeah. Just physically looked. Yeah. Like the sets that they built are obviously um, constructed, manufactured. They were not in any way, shape or form going for realism. They were going for surrealism for sure. Yeah. And so like the staircases are at crazy weird curves and angles and um like everything from the house the house's rooftops to the blades of grass are super pointy and sharp and and the shadows that they employed were just perfect you've never seen a better use of shadows than this they didn't get in the way they just created this mood and it was the first movie to really kind of do that to just take to use the camera for something other than capturing realism uh, and it, 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 for that reason, it's considered the first horror movie because that, that's such a standard part of horror, it, whether large, like in large part, like in a Tim Burton movie or in small part, you know, where you're, um, you're using small spaces to create claustrophobia. The idea of using the set to mess with the viewer's mind, I yeah. think, is, is born in Dr. Caligari's cabinet. Yeah, it's almost like they, they, took a child and gave them construction paper and said, cut out scary things. Right. Uh, and then, like, uh, like that movie, The Babadook, I think, the actual book within The Babadook was hugely inspired by this. Uh, the actual movie itself, um, the plot is about a, a sideshow operator, a hypnotist who um, has a patient that he takes around to these sideshows with a sleep disorder. Supposedly, he's been asleep his entire life. And he uses this patient to commit murder. Right. He's like a sleepwalker. Yeah. A somnambulist. So that in itself is a pretty frightening plot. And to think about that being cooked up in 1920 uh, when there weren't really not such things that you think of as horror movies is pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and then some of the, like the deeper critiques I've seen of it was like the <clears throat> the explanation for why the filmmakers chose like these weird, odd angles to kind of depict insanity or that kind of thing. Yeah, um, was rooted in World War One. The horrors of World War One had just been seen and revealed and recently taken place and it upended Europe in general and, and especially Germany as well. Um, and that the idea is that they, they might not have had this idea. They might not have had this desire, this drive to create this, this weird set. And in fact, this weird movie had World War One not happened. Yeah. This, uh, there's this writer, Jeff Saparito, who, um, kind of put it this way about German expressionism, because I wasn't exactly sure how to define it. Uh, but you're kind of right on the money. He said, Germany was uh, largely isolated from the rest of the world following uh, World War I, so expressionism therefore became confined to the country. It refers to a number of creative movements from World War I through the 1920s. Uh, expressionist works examine the uh, current and future state of the culture through bold and artistic creations of creativity and often explore topics of madness, betrayal, and other intellectual concepts. And nothing encapsulates these ideas more than the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. That's basically <laughs> what I said. Yeah. You, you, did you read that or were you just uh, that? I don't know if I read on. that that one or not. It sounded kind of familiar. Yeah. No, just say you came up with it. Um, so the, the, the idea of the, the set just creating like a creepy tone and texture to everything, um, that, that was Dr. Caligari. That's how it changed the genre. Yeah. Tim Burton, say thank you. Yeah, you, um, have you seen Coraline? No, but I know it. It's a uh, they they did that to very good effect. You know, I think Hodgman does a voice in that, doesn't he? He does. He does the dad. He did a spectacular job because you actually forget it's Hodgman while you're watching it. That's impossible. All right, Chuck. Moving on. That was 1920. We're gonna fast forward all the way to what 1960? 1963. If you're talking about Blood Feast. Well, I wasn't, but let's. <laughs> uh, Cybern, uh, Simon Abrams of RogerEbert.com says this, Blood Feast is a terrible film mm -hmm. and a historically important one, too. Yep. And I think that's sort of the deal with Blood Feast. It is not good by any accounts. Did you watch any of it? Yeah, sure. It's not good. No, it's not good. It's terrible. Uh, it was written on, based on a 14-page outline. Didn't even have a script. It's got the same... Cloying Technicolor of like an early Hawaii Five O episode. Yeah, for sure. Uh, directed by Herschel Gordon Lewis and producer David F. Friedman, and uh, basically the idea was this: these guys did not see films as art; they saw them as a business, and thought you were foolish if you thought it was anything else. So they sat around, they brainstormed movies that they thought <laughs> no one else would make. Yeah, because they started out making like Porky's esque type movies. Yeah. And they were they were doing fine with that, but apparently they were successful enough with it that they started to be imitators, and the market was crowded. So they said, "Where can we go make movies that no one else is going to make?" Yeah, because we want to shock people, essentially. So a couple of ideas they had that did not make the list was Con Man Evangelist and Nazi Torture, <laughs> which which uh, were later made. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they finally said, you know what no one's really done yet is hardcore gore. Yep. Like everyone always cuts away when the knife comes. And you're like, what if we showed the the grossest, goriest stuff imaginable on screen? Yeah, and even still they didn't show. So like a, a, one of the, fir the first murder, a woman stabbed through the eye <coughs> and then the murderer hacked her legs off with a machete. Right. And they didn't show the knife penetrate the eye. They didn't show the machete making contact with the skin. But what they did in Blood Feast and what made Blood Feast the f first of its kind was they would show the what came after that they would show the brains on the ground yeah they would show the entrails like on the knife um they would show the leg being you know that had been dismembered being put into a bag and like the wound that was left by yeah. it yeah like that the, this was to, no one had ever done anything like that on film before no and and it paid off they um depending on who you ask the the budget was uh, anywhere from like 20 to 30 grand and it made between 7 and 30 million dollars uh, like I said depending on where you get your info but it, by all accounts it was a huge financial success 
Yeah. Uh, compared to what they paid to make it. Yeah, and they, they shot it in, um, I think, <clears throat> six days or something down in Miami. Yeah. Um, based on a 14-page outline. There wasn't even a script. It was an outline. Basically, it was like, murderer goes and kills this girl. Yeah. Next girl, murderer comes in, kills girl, cuts off leg, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. I mean, if it matters, the movie's about a serial killer caterer. <laughs> yeah, that's it. There's your plot right there. Yep. Um, but the the it was just such a, a revolutionary movie that the censors at the time, there wasn't such a thing as the MPAA hadn't been formed yet. Um, and there was basically no one except for local censors overseeing movies. Yeah. So, you know, you, you could be playing in one town um, to all audiences, and then the next town over, it could be banned. But the censors had never seen anything like it, and they didn't know what to do with it. So yeah. it, it, it was hugely successful commercially, too. Yeah, and uh, another big impact it had was it inspired a generation of special effects. But basically, um, let's be honest, young boys who were doing this on their own Super 8 films right? and said, wait, uh, I can get a job doing this? Yep. So, including. Off. Tom Savini, I think, was inspired by it, wasn't he? Oh, really? Or was he inspired by... Yeah, I think he was inspired by Blood Feast. Oh, wow. Um, and then we should also give a, a mention to the Grand Guignol. Is that how you think it's pronounced? Sure. Grand Guignol? Sure. Uh, it, it was a theater in Paris, I believe, from the late 19th century on to, I think, 1962. So the year before Blood Feast came out, it yeah. had closed up. But it used to do this stuff on stage. It was like a gore fest. Um, and there was lots of like blood and sex and, and like depraved themes in the plays that were put on at this theater. And people loved it. They were crazy for it. Um, and the, this was kind of like the Grand Guignol tradition put onto film for the first time. And hooray for that. You want to take a break? Yeah, let's do it. All right, Charles, we're back. So 1960 or 1968? <laughs> uh, I've got 1968 in front of my face. Okay. Uh, right. And that could be no other movie than Night of the Living Dead, classic George Romero film. Uh, Romero was a TV director, making TV commercials, commercial and director, rather. He was also making short films for Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood at the time. Yeah. And he, was, he was young. Yeah. I, keep, I don't. I don't know how old he was, but he was a pretty young guy still. I in think. It, I think when he made shot Night of the Living Dead, he was like twenty six or twenty seven. Wow. So, uh, yeah, by any standard, that's still pretty young, unless you're twenty three. So he, um, he had, um, he and his buddies were like, "Let's make a horror movie, <laughs> but let's not make a stupid horror movie. Let's make one with like an actual plot that explores like deep themes to, like a good movie. Let's let's make the first good horror movie. Well, yeah, so, and we'll delve into that a little more, but that that was definitely a different thing at the time. And the other different thing was that all of the horror movies up to that point, uh, they were called the Universal Monsters from Universal Studios, you know, all the, mm -hmm. the kind of the classic Frankenstein and Dracula and Creature from the Black Lagoon and the Werewolf. And uh, that was where, that was mainstream horror. And George Romero comes along and says, um... How about zombies? <laughs> and everyone said, what in the world's a zombie? And he said, well, uh, let me define that for every future generation of movie and TV goers and lovers. Well, yeah, and there had been zombie movies before, but they had been things like like Dr. Caligari's Cabinet, somebody who was under the control of something, someone else or something like that. There was a hypnotist. or This was... Like the the first time, what we think of as zombies were ever introduced, like flesh eating ghouls who were dead and Undead. come back to life. Yeah, just what you think of as a zombie. This guy started that genre, like you said. Yeah, they uh, shot it outside and in, in Pittsburgh uh, on about one hundred and fifteen thousand dollar budget. 
Not bad. Ended up grossing twelve million domestic. Not bad. And I think close to twenty worldwide. And um was eventually selected by the Library of Congress for preservation in the National Film Registry. It's a good movie. It, it's a very good movie. Uh, they shot it in black and white to save on cost, even though color was the standard by that point. And mm-hmm. uh, black and white is also a little more forgiving for rudimentary special effects. And uh, one of the revolutionary things he did was uh, cast a black actor as the lead. And for no other reason than, hey, this guy Dwayne Jones is really good. Exactly right. <laughs> like he didn't go back and go, oh well, you know, our our hero is black, so we need to make the the whole thing a meditation on race and have him confront racism. It it was just we're, here's the script, and then the guy playing the lead just happens to be black. Right, and he was the best guy in the auditions, and you know, in 1968, this didn't really happen. You didn't just cast a black guy as a lead actor for no with no like ulterior motive, basically. Right. So I read this review from the from the time, from 1969, the year after it came out. A uh, young Roger Ebert went and watched it and wrote yeah. a review. And he wrote um, a, a a pretty pretty interesting review, which is basically it was about the reaction of the audience. And he went to a Saturday matinee that was populated almost entirely by 10, 11 year olds. Oh wow! And they were used to seeing the creature from the Black Lagoon or Frankenstein. Or, um, you know, just just movies that uh, any kid could handle and could enjoy watching and, you know, fun, scary kind of stuff. Yeah. And he said that's how the, the, that was how the crowd reacted for the first half of the movie. But then about the point where, and here's, here comes spoilers, everybody. If you haven't seen Night of the Living Dead, just hit yourself in the knee with a hammer. Um, you, the, the, the. T- the teenage couple go to get gas, and when their car blows up and is engulfed in flames, they die. They're burned to death. He said, right about that time, the tone, the mood of the theater changed, and there was no, like, gleeful screaming anymore. Kids were starting to, like, not move and were afraid to, like, move in their seats, and some were c- quietly crying to themselves. And from that, the whole the whole point on, it just got worse and worse for these little kids watching this movie. So it was a huge uh, impact on horror movies, A. it uh, Like you said earlier, it was kind of the first one to really sort of delve into other issues. Like if, if you look up like significance of Night of the Living Dead or um, meaning of Night of the Living Dead or something like that, there are scores of articles that have been written over the years of how it was a metaphor for the Vietnam War or an allegory about distrust of authority or the collapse of traditional family. And I think Romero said, like, I didn't necessarily mean all these things, but you can certainly find it in the movie. That is art. Like, one of the great revelations of my adult life is that the artist, the writer, the songwriter, the, um, the author rarely intends to imbue as much meaning into their work as people take from it. That that's part of art is interpretation. Yeah. Isn't that neat? Yeah. Like, you don't, <laughs> if you're a writer, if you're a young writer right now who's just sitting there racking your brain for how to insert metaphor and, and meaning into this, just write your story and people are going to find it for themselves. Yeah, agreed. I wish somebody had told me that when I was younger. I had teachers that said stuff like that. Oh, I didn't. Like good college uh, professors in English that would, when students would argue, like, I think he means this, he would say, like, you know, he may or she may not have meant anything. Right. Like, I had, that's the revelation. I had teachers that would just go, wrong. Uh, the other thing about Night of the Living Dead is it spawned, um, obviously, the the zombie genre in uh, sequels, Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, Return of the Living Dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Walking Dead remakes. Like, yeah, shout out, shout out, Stephen Yoon. Yeah, right. Yeah. Why not? I'm still into The Walking Dead. You? Yeah, we talked about this. Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. We okay. Did. Stephen Yoon listens. <laughs> uh, anyway, zombies are, I think, still hot, and we can so hot. We we owe that all to Mr. Romero, master of the genre. Chuck, one more thing, too, that, that Night of the Living Dead did that they weren't the first, but very famously Romero did was kill off his hero senselessly and shockingly Yeah, at the end. 
Good point. Thanks, man. Okay, so let's move on. Like I said, 1973. Yes. Day if, after Christmas. If you've ever been uh, in Washington, D.C., at the end of M Street, you might have noticed a very, uh, during the daytime, ordinary set of stairs. At nighttime, maybe they look creepy to you because those are the exorcist stairs. Yeah. I'm trying to conjure the music in my head, but all I'm coming up with is the Unsolved Mysteries music. It's it was not, not quite there. right. <laughs> so close, but it's not it. I'm so unsatisfied right now. So The Exorcist was uh, based on a book by William Peter Blatty, who uh, wrote this uh, in 1971, and then in 73 the movie was made. Uh, and there's, I think I referenced not too long ago, a great uh, Mark Maron interview with um, William Friedkin, mm -hmm. where he talks about the audition process for Linda Blair. So you should go listen to that, because it was pretty insightful. But um, The Exorcist really kind of changed the game. Um in that it was, A, it spawned a bit of a subgenre of um, demonic movies. Sure, that uh, were like religious-based. Yeah, even though I guess Rosemary's Baby was before that, but The Exorcist was such a mega hit, and it was nominated for Best Picture, the first horror movie to be nominated um, for, yeah. for that. And so it was just like, it was a big deal. It was. It sold six million tickets in about two months. Yeah, it's amazing. This is a horror movie, right? And it came out of nowhere. Um, apparently, the effect it had on audiences was extremely pronounced. There was a woman in Boston who had to be carried from the theater. And she goes, it cost me $4, but I only lasted 20 minutes. <laughs> So word like that's the stories of that got around and and people wanted to see, you know, this movie can't be that scary. And they went and they were like, oh my god, that movie is that scary. Yeah, and it holds up too. I mean, um, special effects are they'd never quite hold up, but it's still a very creepy movie. Um, mm -hmm. Very famously, uh, Linda Blair played the the little girl who was possessed by a demon, and uh, the 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 heavy hitters were called in <laughs> to, to exercise this demon, including um, a Max Van Sydow who was only 44 when what? he played this guy in his, easily in his 70s. Yeah, was he Benjamin Button? Well, no, they, they made him up. Wow, they did a great job. Yeah, which I don't see why they felt the need to do that. I know they, um, God, who else did they almost cast? Oh, uh, Brando. They almost cast Brando, but... That I think, would have been a colossal mistake. Well, Friedkin said, you know what, as soon as you do that, it's a Marlon Brando movie. Yeah. And I think he said picture, a Brando picture. Sure, that's what they said. Uh, and he didn't want it to be a Brando picture. He wanted to be The Exorcist. Um, so the, the you said it was based on a book from two years before by William Peter Blatty. He, yeah. he apparently was known as a, a comedy writer. <laughs> And he wanted to do something different. He said, hey, wouldn't it be funny if the little girl's head spun around and she puked <laughs> green bile? And wait, what will you hear what I have her do with a crucifix? <laughs> hey -o. So um, he actually wrote the book because he wanted to scare America back to church. That was his aim with the book. It may have worked. He, he believed that there was real evil going on in the world and that part of it was because of a, a loss of faith or a loss of religion, I guess. And yeah. that's what he wanted to do with it. Um, and when the movie came out, there was a huge pushback from religious authorities. Like oh, Billy sure. Graham said he believed the movie itself was possessed by a <laughs> demon. I'm not sure how that would happen, but that was like a huge thing at the time. Um, and a lot of a lot of other... Um, religious establishment types were like, don't go see that movie. It's evil. But there were some who who were part of uh, part of religion, major organized religion, who kind of saw through it and said, no, no, this is, it's good that we're talking about this, that they're, we're telling people, you know, or people are seeing that there there's such a thing as like good versus evil literally combating on earth, you yeah. know, and people are talking about this and thinking about it. And so in that sense, The Exorcist like really kind of went to bat for organized religion. Oh, interesting. I saw another um, criticism of it, though, that, that said one of the themes of the movie that the book hadn't really intended, but the movie picked up on and expounded on, was intergenerational conflict. That, that it was Reagan, the child, 
represented the younger generation who was at war with the establishment and that it even goes um, so far as to where her mother, the actress, the movie that she's working on is about a campus takeover by young radicals. Huh. So that that's kind of a theme that was apparently part of the subtext, but was a, a major part of it in the movie, at least. Interesting. Yeah, I thought so, too, because apparently, I mean, you think of intergenerational <laughs> conflict now, apparently in the late 60s and early 70s, it was sharper than it probably ever has been before or since. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. only other thing I got is that the uh, the green stuff that she projectiles was... Uh, Anderson's pea soup and a little bit of oatmeal for nice. texture. Anderson's pea soup. Well, I bet you can't get that anymore. Chuck, let's do Jaws and then we'll take a break. I love talking about Jaws. Yeah. I mean, Jaws is on, you know, I did my top favorite movies list uh, at one point on our website and I listed Jaws as my favorite movie. Favorite of all time. Yeah. I mean, that list changes, but it's Jaws is always in my top five. I can wow. watch it anytime it's on. Uh, it is one of the, I've all, I've often said it's a perfect movie. Um, and what I mean by that is there's just not a misstep. Like the casting was perfect. The acting was great. The script was great. It played out just perfectly Mm -hmm. throughout the film. Um, he like Spielberg was just a master storyteller with that movie. You were talking about how young George Romero was in Night of the Living Dead. Spielberg was 26 when he made Jaws. He was 13 years old. <laughs> right. He, uh, and he was apparently scared to death when he finished filming. Uh, the schedule had been for 55 days. It went to 159. Yeah. His, he had, I think, been allotted $4 million. He ended up spending $12 million on it. Um, yeah, largely because A, shooting on water is notoriously difficult, and B, uh, the shark, the mechanical shark they use was uh, legendarily um, wonky in yeah. how it, or not wonky, but wanky? Wonky. <laughs> it didn't work. No. It rarely worked. So they spent a lot of time and burnt a lot of uh, hours trying to get this shark to do its thing. And uh, so much so that it didn't even make that many appearances in the movie. I think they even kind of scaled it back, and that ended up being better for the movie because you didn't get as much shark. I looked up the um, the <clears throat> urban legend about the shark being named after Spielberg's lawyer, Bruce, and apparently it's true. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, Bruce Rayner was the name of Spielberg's lawyer, and the, that was the nickname for the mechanical shark on the set was Bruce. That's pretty funny. So with Jaws, right? We're we're talking about horror movies that change the genre. Jaws not only changed the horror genre, it changed movie making to this day. Yeah. And in multiple ways, multiple massive ways. It it changed the entire film industry almost single handedly. Yeah, it was uh at the time there was a uh there was no such thing. You take it for granted now, but there was no such thing as a quote unquote, summer release. No, a lot of theaters closed down because AC wasn't in every theater and people didn't want to sit around in a hot movie theater for two hours. Yeah, a summer release or a a tentpole film or a blockbuster feature. Like, Jaws was the first one of all those. At the time when Jaws came out, they used to um, (laughs) release a movie on maybe one, two screens in, say, New York or L.A. for a week, and then it'd make its way to, you know, Atlanta, Minneapolis, Chicago uh, for a few weeks, and then eventually it'd make it to your small town six, eight weeks later. Yeah. That was how movies were released. Not Jaws. Jaws was released on 435 screens across the country, which is huge, which is part of the the, um, (laughs) summer blockbuster release playbook now. Yeah, and it was also the first movie to to spend lots and lots of money on marketing. Um, and so I think the studios were like, wait a minute, if you spend some dough on marketing, you release this thing wide, you can make a ton of money in the first month that a movie's out mm-hmm. and you're kind of set. Like after that, it's anything else is gravy. Yeah. And, and that's it, after it, the first like week or two probably. Yeah, it was. Yeah, the whole the whole point of blockbuster now is to get that opening weekend to make all your money back in the opening weekend, and then yeah. everything else is gravy on top of it, right? 
Jaws was, uh, it didn't make its, I don't know, maybe it did make its money back in the first weekend because it, it hit a hundred million dollars in like 78 days or something incredible like that because it was the first movie to hit a hundred million dollars and it did it in just a couple months even. Yeah, it eventually went on to make uh, to about $260 million domestically, uh, which is, I mean, that's a great take now. Yeah. You know, much less uh, the mid-1970s. Sure. For a $12 million spend, for sure. My only beef here is that I would not consider Jaws a horror movie. <laughs> yeah. I think it's an adventure film. Yeah, I guess you're right. With a scary antagonist. Yeah. But um, it's amazing how much I quote that movie in my day-to-day -day life. Yeah. A sh -sh -sh shark <laughs> That's a great, that's a classic. <laughs> All right, let's take a break. I'm going to meditate on that line, <laughs> and we'll talk about uh, a few other scary movies, including one that was originally titled Scary Movie. Okay, moving on to Halloween. Halloween, Chuck. 1978, I believe. Halloween. Yes. John Carpenter. Uh, a youngish John Carpenter mm -hmm. who originally titled this movie The Babysitter Murders. No. A little on the nose. Yeah. A pretty terrifying title. I guess. Uh, young Jamie Lee Curtis, her very first movie. Was it really? Yeah. Well, she went on to become known as the Scream Queen. Yeah. For all the horror movies she was in. Totally. And this was uh, shot in 20 days in uh, South Pasadena as the Midwest. And um, it was, it's credited as being uh, birthing the slasher genre. Yeah, it did. So there were slasher films before it. The Town That Dreaded Sundown. Good movie. It was like based on a true crime story, actually, in yeah. Texas. Uh, one called Black Christmas, The Grabster Sites from 1974. Haven't heard of that one. But the idea of um, of a faceless, almost a, a like non entity entity coming at you uh, and relentlessly stalking you, being impervious to harm, as the yeah. grabster puts it, um, and just coming at you <laughs> again and again, trying to kill you. That that was. That was all established by Halloween, and it was done, like, to, to great effect as well. Yeah, and it holds up. It's still scary. Uh, Michael Myers, of course, was the killer. Um, the, the music that John Carpenter scored, I mean, he, he scores most of his movies himself, but yeah. um, very iconic, uh, basic thing. I think he only took a couple of days to come up with it. But, like, the Michael Myers character and the mask are so iconic. The music is so iconic. You know about the mask, right? Shatner. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I went and checked that one out too to verify that it was true, and it definitely is true that the yeah. Michael Myers mask is actually a Captain Kirk Star Trek mask painted white. Yep. And that is history. Yep. In the in the script, uh, when it came to the mask, it just said uh, pale neutral features of a man. Yeah, which makes the whole thing even creepier because sure. he's an implacid or a, uh, is that the right word? I don't know. He's just, it's just almost like a, a, just an emotionless killer. Oh, yeah. It, it made the fact that he was merciless, <clears throat> ruthless, pitiless, and and all arbitrarily killing people almost mm -hmm. um, all the more pronounced because his expression never changes. Well, to me, the two things that were creepiest about Halloween was the expression never changed because of that mask, mm -hmm. and he did not run. Like, oh yeah, he would just walk, and you still got the feeling like you can't outrun this guy, even though he's walking. <laughs> that was another creepy part about it. It follows was the walking <laughs> aspect of it. Oh yeah, it, for sure. Yeah, yeah. In, in the same way that like twenty eight days later was freaky, and that it took zombies and made them run. Yeah, or I remember when I saw uh, Friday the 13th, I'm sorry, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street for the first time, and Freddy Krueger was running around. I was like, that's not what scary dudes do. Yeah, scary dudes don't trot. No, they, they walk very creepily toward you and still 
somehow gain speed on you even though you're running full speed. Well, Freddy scared me to death the first time I saw that movie. Yeah, the no, first one was a pretty good one. But Halloween established the, like you said, it established the slasher genre and everything about slasher films still today, all rooted in, in Halloween, John Carpenter's tropes. Yeah. And again, like you said, there were a couple of other slasher films before, but none of them grossed close to 50 million bucks. Wow. Is that how much Halloween made? Yeah. 47 million domestic at about a $300,000 budget. So it, uh, you know, it's sort of like with The Exorcist, like there were other movies that sort of did this thing before, but when you have a huge hit that does it, right. is when it sort of redefines the genre. Because exactly. it makes money. Yeah. And that's all and that matters. Everybody, everyone starts paying attention after that. <laughs> all right, what's next? What's next, my friend, is a movie that came out when, I don't know, were you still in college? Uh, no. You must have just been out then. I was out a few years. Okay, well, regardless, around our college era... <laughs> This movie came out, because up to this point, everything's come out either when we were little or before we were born. This yes. one was right in our wheelhouse. It was the Blair Witch Project, which came out in 1998. Yeah, and uh, one of the big things that um, Blair Witch Project did, well, two things really. It established the found footage uh, genre or subgenre that is so overplayed now in mm -hmm. uh, the viral marketing campaign, and that's how I came upon it. I remember very specifically... Uh, being in the apartment of Scott Ippolito, who you know. Sure. He shot our TV show. One of my oldest friends, and I was sitting in his apartment on Claremont Avenue uh, in Decatur, and I happened upon this, and this was pre-Facebook. I don't even know how I found it, you know, before things were being shared around. Right. And I happened upon this website, the very first Blair Witch Project website, and I was like, dude, come over here and check this out. This is the scariest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. And I remember the, the the website set it up as if it was real and that this found footage thing, it's so overdone now, it's hard to go back in time and remember when it was fresh. But I remember looking at it and being like, did this happen? Did right. they really find this footage of this murder in the woods? Like, well, I got to see this. That was the rumor that this was actually real, man. And this yeah. was, like you said, I mean, this is before the found footage genre. So people were being exposed to this concept for the first time and we're kind of falling for it. I mean, first of all, you're, you're either in college or you're just recently out of college. So you're maybe slightly more gullible than you are 10 <laughs> years on. You're ready to believe it. You want to believe, right? Uh -huh. So yeah, the idea that this was actual found footage, it, it just made it all the more enjoyable and people were buying into it. Then I think the other part of it too was that the filmmakers, partly because they didn't have the budget for actual effects, left a lot of the 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 scariest parts to your imagination. Yeah, nor did they have the talent to make a good narrative film. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I mean, they worked on a 64-page script, which I was surprised that it was that that big. But they shot it for eight days. And originally, they were going to make it like a documentary about the found footage. Right. And then one of them had a flash of, of perspective. and was like, wait, 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 wait. Let's just release it like it's found footage. And that was that. The rest was history. Yeah, and I'm poking fun. That was not very nice at all. Um, Eduardo Sanchez and Daniel uh, Myrick or Myrick, the co-directors, they they should be credited with a truly ingenious uh, campaign and invention. That well, they weren't the first to come up with found footage, right? No. There were some films before. Um, I've never known how to pronounce it. Mondo Cane or Mondo Kane? I think Cane. It's from 1962, and it was supposedly a documentary about, um, like, some so, like weird tribal rituals. I think there's head shrinking maybe involved, and it purported to be, like, real footage. Yeah. Same with Cannibal Holocaust, which, oh, man. if you've never seen Cannibal Holocaust, go out and watch it right now. Yeah. It's very disturbing. Um, and it's so disturbing that the director of the movie was charged with murder, because they believed that the the actual murders depicted, they were so realistic, they thought that it was a snuff film, basically. But it was yeah. supposed to be a documentary as well. So there was an idea of, like, found footage or documentary-style horror movies that had come before, but nothing like The Blair Witch, where it was just straight yeah. up, these people, we found their their old camera, and this is what was on it. Well, and they were smart enough to kind of dig up an old thing that, never went huge, you know? And they're like, hey, man, right. like these other movies, 
they never really hit it big. And they, it was a timing thing. They, they, uh, I mean, hats off for them, to them. Yeah. Good for them and to them. Nice going, dudes. <laughs> All right, Chuck, Scream. Yeah, Scream. I, I teased that it was originally titled Scary Movie. I'm glad it wasn't because <laughs> Scary Movie is awesome. I well, don't know what Scary yeah. Movie ever would have been called. Maybe it would have never been made. Or maybe they would have called that Scream. Oh, yeah, I guess so. So uh, Scream was a very big deal when it came out. Uh, the writer Kevin Williamson... Um, and this is still the highest growing slasher film of all time, basically. Scream 1 yeah. is. It was huge. I got Nev Campbell's haircut as a result of it. <laughs> like, it was a big, big pop culture watermark. It was. And one of the big things about it, aside from the boatloads of money that it made, uh, was it spawned a subgenre called meta horror, which is, um, even though it had been done, by no less than its own director, Wes Craven, yeah. with Wes Craven's new nightmare uh, two years before Scream. It wasn't nearly as popular, but meta horror is this idea. And if you've ever seen Scream, you know they're constantly just referencing horror movies. Like, this is where, you know, you don't go out and make out in the car because that's where you get killed. And then they would do that and get killed. Right. Although I don't think that specific thing happened. <laughs> like, don't go back in the house. Yeah, like all the tropes of horror movies are addressed in the movie. And they're talking about them as the horror movie tropes. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Meta-horror. Yeah. yeah, and there are plenty of other things that came along, <laughs> meta-horror meta um, examples. Like, have you seen Tucker and Dale versus Evil? Uh, No, it's a good one. Oh, check it out, man. All right. That's a good movie. Um, Zombieland? Yeah, I did see that. Uh, where he's rattling off all of the things that you need to, to know to survive a zombie apocalypse that he learned from zombie movies, right. right? And then Cabin in the Woods, did you see that one? Uh, great movie. It was a great movie. I thought it was really good. I, I mean, from beginning to end, it was a great movie. Did you like Scream? Yeah, love Scream. I liked all the Screams. I only saw the first two. The second one, I think, might have been even better than the first. Uh, maybe. To me. <laughs> and that the second one was shot. Emily worked on that. It was shot here in at Agnes Scott College, partially. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Huh. Right I'll have to go back and watch it knowing that now. I'll be like, oh, I, I've driven past that place. <laughs> uh, so I got a few tidbits. Uh, like I said, initial title was Scary Movie. Um, number two, the Weinstein brothers initially offered it to George Romero and Sam Raimi. Um, what else do I have here? Drew Barrymore was originally supposed to play Sydney, the lead character. And then she said... No. How about if I just play that girl at the beginning, which kind of was a big thing because you see Drew Mary, uh, Barrymore and it was a big shock when she died in the first scene. Right. You know? You can't kill off your heroine right away. Yeah. And I'm like, I remember, I remember that first scene really, really scaring me when I saw it the first time in the theater. Yeah, it is. It's a scary, gruesome, gory part. Yeah, very well played. Uh, and then before he went to um, Nev Campbell, he went out to Alicia Witt, Brittany Murphy, and Reese Witherspoon. <laughs> and then Nev Campbell and then was like, oh, Nev Campbell. <laughs> that was your first choice, right? Uh, and then the mask, the iconic uh, screen mask, apparently was an off-the-shelf mask. Wow, that made that company's <clears throat> money. Yeah, and the Weinsteins didn't like it. They were like, I, I hate that mask. Everything else is fine. Huh. But Wes Craven said, no, it's got to be that mask. Don't be stupid, Bob. <laughs> All right. Okay. We're going to finish up with uh, our own edition here. Finally, 1960. Yes. Psycho. I can't believe this wasn't in the list. I think Ed kept this off the list to toy with somebody he doesn't like specifically. That's the only oh. explanation. Yeah, because Psycho changed everything. Yeah, it really did. I mean, it was the... You could say that it was one of the first slasher flicks. It was a early psychological thriller. Yeah. Um, it was based on the real life story of Ed Gein. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't exactly mirror Ed Gein's life, <laughs> but the idea of um, being obsessed with your mother so much that you will commit murder uh, is definitely rooted in Ed Gein's story. Yeah. Um, if you're not familiar with Ed Gein, he not only. He was a, a, I don't even know if he was a serial killer. I think he only, I think he murdered one, maybe two people. But more than anything, he was a grave robber. 
but he likes to um, dress up in people's skin, women's skin, and pretend he was his own mother, which, uh, man, that's a lot of years on the couch working that one out. Yeah. Or you can just die at the hands of cops, one of the two. <laughs> um, and he also inspired Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, and, and Buffalo Bill, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah. From Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, one guy inspired all those, yeah, all those guys. So I found this article, uh, Psycho, colon, the horror movie that changed the genre by uh, Owen uh, Gleiberman, or is it Gleiberman? Gleiber, Gleiberman, I think. He wrote for, he, legendary critic, wrote for yeah. EW for years and years and now writes for Variety. Oh, he does? Yeah, but he uh, he put it best. He said, um, well, you know, the iconic shower scene, first of all, is hugely important because it was, uh, Hitchcock really kind of ripped up the script, not literally, but the horror movie script, when he kills off Janet Lee halfway through the movie, it was you just didn't do that at the time. No, and, and we came seen, out of nowhere. And we've seen that come up later on, like at the end of Night of the Living Dead or Drew Barrymore in Scream. Hitchcock was the first one to do that. Yeah, and uh, Gleiberman puts it uh, this way: He said uh, he was also slicing through years, decades, centuries, even of audience expectation that the hero or heroine of a fictional work would be shielded and protected or would at least die, usually at the end, in a way that made some sort of moral dramatic sense. Right. Uh, in Psycho, the murder made no sense at all. <laughs> right. And he really kind of hits it on the head there. It was like, if if you've never seen Psycho or heard of it, the movie's just going along about this woman who, like, steals some money from her work and she's kind of on the lam and checks into this hotel and you don't even know it's a horror movie. You're thinking it's a... A movie about a lady who steals money and is trying to get away from getting caught. <laughs> right. And then just out of nowhere, she's hacked up in a shower. And at the time, audiences, and still if you haven't seen it, it's shocking, but audiences were just like, they didn't know what they'd seen. Right, exactly. So you're, not not only is, is the hero no longer safe, that means maybe you're not either. Yeah. So it has a, it had a really huge unsettling effect. And then Owen Gleiberman points out that Hitchcock was so smart that he even he he even made a nod to the the type of pat expected <clears throat> horror that the audience was used to in the house that he used for Psycho, the Bates house. Yeah. It was this huge rambling Victorian mansion on a hill. And there was lots of taxidermy and uh, it was like over over decorated and just creepy. But up to that point, like that was horror. That was what a horror movie looked like and felt like. And this was, this was kind of Hitchcock's homage to that. But at the same time, he was also putting the heel of his shoe on it as well. Yeah, and that house was, I mean, almost a character in itself. Like if you've ever seen the recreation of it, at uh, in in Los Angeles, I think it's at Universal. Did you see it? Oh yeah, I never did. The closest I came was um, I think uh, when Different Strokes went there. <laughs> That's the closest you got to it. Yeah, uh, yeah, man. If you've ever seen this thing in person, like it's it sends a chill up your back just seeing this thing in like a sunny Los Angeles day. Still, That's awesome. It's such an iconic house. It's like, oh man, uh, there it is. That's where Norman Bates lives. He's the most disturbed human of all time. Right. Uh, so in the movie, of course, there was the the mother character who is sort of uh, referenced throughout the movie. And it is not until the end that you realize that there is no mother. Mother's dead. Right. There's just Norman Bates and all his rage and hang-ups. Yeah. So all the monster movies about giant ants and or the creature from the Black Lagoon, monsters, things that were an other that a normal person had to do battle with, that was gone. Yeah. Now the monster had been on screen the whole time and you had noticed it. And now <clears throat> what do you think about your neighbor who has seemed a little weird from time to time before? Could he be a murderer who thinks he's his mother? Who knows? <laughs> yeah. This is what Hitchcock did to everybody back in 1960. And you almost get, like, I think Owen Gleiberman points it out. Yeah, he does. At the beginning, he basically says, like, um, we probably didn't see Psycho. If you're reading this, you're probably too young to have seen Psycho in 1960. And we should all feel sad that we didn't. Because yeah. it's so changed everything oh, sure. that we can't do anything but take it for granted now. And everything that's come since then has been trying to regain that shock and horror 
that it instilled in audiences. And, and thus far, no one's actually been able to do it. Yeah, and I, the other thing, I remember when I saw it when I was younger, I think I saw this when I was like 14-ish, um, and I think it had this impact on just about everyone. I don't think I took a shower for a month. Yeah. I was straight up bathtub, curtain open, doors open, windows open. Making your mom watch? <laughs> uh, She's keeping watch? No, that would have been f full circle back to Psycho Oh, yeah, again. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> you didn't even want to have anything to do with your mom. No, man. Like, it, it changed the shower curtain industry for a while after yeah. that. Yeah, I'll bet. Very good movie. And the, um, there were a yeah, couple of Hitchcock movies in the last few years, uh, two different ones. Uh, one with Anthony Hopkins and one with Toby Jones that were both really good. And one was about the years that he was making Psycho. The other was about the years when he was making The Birds. And they were both really, really good movies. And you should check those out too. You should repeat that. We just got a, a rare okay. interjection from Noel. So go ahead and say it again, Josh, in case it didn't come through. So Noel just said that um, the director of The Black Coat's Daughter is Anthony Perkins, who played Norman Bates in Psycho's son. Wow. He also did another movie now that Noel says that. Thanks, Noel. Um, it's called The Pretty Little Thing That Lives in the House, which is another Ooh. horror movie, a ghost story. I think that creepy. was his first one. And I think that might be on Netflix. It's great. It's a really great movie, too. Man, this has got me fired up to see some horror movies. It's a renaissance of horror. Yeah, it's tough, though, because Emily doesn't really dig it. So I have to just find alone time to do this. Go to watch it in the bathroom. <sighs> All right. Well, if you want to know more about horror movies, go watch horror movies. Go forth. Uh, and, and let us know what we missed, for God's sake. Yeah. If you want to check out Grabster's list, type in horror movies on the search bar at houseofworks.com and it'll bring up this fine, fine list that you'll disagree with. And um, since I said disagree, it's time for listener mail. Uh, this is from Eric, and I'm going to call it what he called it a schoolhouse rock nostalgia theory. All right. I think it's pretty right on. This just came in, actually. This is a hot take. Uh, hey, guys, in Schoolhouse Rock episode, Josh made the statement that Gen Xers are most nostalgic generation and attribute it to the success of Schoolhouse Rock. I'm going to offer my own theory. I propose that Gen X is nostalgic mostly for pop culture because of the prolifer... Uh, that word. Of child-targeted advertisements and marketing in the 70s and 80s. Huh, maybe. It's certainly something we've talked about. Um yes. Theory's got legs. While our little impressionable brains were developing, we were being taught by those who were steering pop culture to long for and find fulfillment in the toys and other products our cartoons were pushing on us. Now as adults, those messages are still deep in our psyche, and we can't shake the idea that we still really need those Star Wars action figures to be happy. Not because the toys and the shows were so great, but because we had been tricked into believing we need them. I have nothing scientific to back this up. Just a hunch. Yeah, what, you mean there hasn't been a study from MIT right. on Star Wars toys? I'm kind of surprised by that as well. I thought you were being facetious at first and I then was. it just and took a in, turn. Yeah, I don't know which way up at this point. Yeah, uh, Nothing scientific to back this up, but I'd love to hear what you all think. See if anyone out there is uh, any respectable and informed input. Love what you I guys do. I love you, Eric. That is from <laughs> Eric Lewin. And Eric, uh, I think that's super valid. Yeah, I do too, Eric. I think you've really hit upon something here. And that's all I have to say about it. If you have a great theory, fan theory, real life theory, whatever, we want to hear them. They're, especially if it's interesting. You yeah. can tweet to us at SYSK Podcast. You can send us an email to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, stuffyoushouldknow.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.